thank you for watching a uh, new edition of the Leon Ferraro conferences, one of our online programs honoring the memory of um, uni uh, Columbia University professor uh, Leon Ferraro, who at the beginning of the 20th century, almost single-handedly, uh, created what we would now call a coherent cultural diplomacy program. Uh, he was a true uh, pioneer and uh, so is um, our guest uh, today, uh, who is, uh, I would say, much more famous and uh, working on a much bigger, um, uh, on a much bigger scale and canvas. Uh, my guest um, today uh, is, I would um, argue, one of the most original minds uh, working in uh, international relations um, uh, today, um, a uh, seminal thinker uh, whose um, concepts of um, nation branding, uh, competitive identity, uh, and most, um, uh, most recently, but mo most importantly, um, the good country um, have shaped the way um, state and non-state um, uh, actors, professionals and academics understand the um, standing of countries uh, on the international scale and the role and impact of um, national uh, reputation in foreign affairs. My guest is also um, a, um, the creator of two important uh, men measurements when it comes to um, international uh, relations and the uh, image making of, um, of nations. Uh, the um, um, Anhold Ipsos um, Nation Brands um, Index and the Good Country uh, uh, Index. He is um, a most persuasive uh, um, speaker and uh, author whose um, TED talk, uh, now uh, exceeding, I think, 12 million uh, viewers, has been one of the most uh, popular talks uh, in the history of the program. Uh, Simon Anhold, uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Dorian. It's a pleasure. Uh, I would um, I would start uh, with a, um, a set of personal or more personal um, questions, as um, I believe, uh, of course, you are uh, appearing in a lot of programs. You are um, interviewed uh, in um, uh, in. Uh, practically all the, all the time, but um, I believe you have uh, had um, um, much fewer, um, much fewer um, uh, occasions to talk about your formation. And, uh, and um, uh, it's, um, you, you have a background in, uh, in literature and uh, social and cultural anthropology and later in international uh, relations and uh, security studies. Uh, this marriage, uh, quite unusual marriage between, um, between humanities and political science, international relations, how, how did it, uh, did it shape uh, your understanding of international relations and your thinking about international reputations and about competition, uh, collaboration on the international scale? Well, the, the part of my education that was to do with international relations, international studies more properly, uh, and security studies was very much an afterthought. Um, I'm, I'm one of those relatively unusual people who went back to school um, in adult life, and I would recommend it to anybody. The, the experience of effectively being a student again uh, at the age of, uh, I don't know what I was, 40 or 50, uh, was remarkable. And it made me think, my God, I wish you could do this backwards. I wish you could go out and get a job when you're seven or eight years old and then go to school when you're 50 or 60 because, because you learn so much better and so much more and so much more enthusiastically as an adult. When, when I was at university doing my first degree, 
I was a I was a naughty child. Uh, I didn't pay attention. I didn't take notes. I didn't revise before exams. And so I found myself having to basically study everything all over again after I'd finished just to knock it into my head. On the other hand, when I had the opportunity to do the uh, the international course at the Royal College of Defence Studies in London, which was, as I say, a much, much later life. Um, it was a wonderful experience because I was soaking up knowledge like a sponge, quite spontaneously taking notes without even thinking about it. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, the power of wisdom. <laughs> exactly, and patience. But the, the, the reason why uh, I made the decision to, to, to start studying again at that late stage was because I realized that my education, like the education of so many of us, was very unbalanced. Um, it was all on what you might call the soft side. Uh, it was the stuff that appealed to me as I, when I was a kid. Uh, literature, language, soft things. And then after I'd Not been- Not soft, I would say, but- <laughs> I'm being deliberately rude about it, but you know, you, 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 mean, you know what I mean. In fact, I distinctly remember, um, when I was uh, about 16, the school asking me what I wanted to do for my final subject choice, because in the UK where I was studying, you have to pick three or four subjects. And I knew what I wanted to do. I said, I want to do, um, I want to do French, Latin and biology, because those were the subjects that interested me most. And to my disappointment, my teacher said, don't be silly. You, you're, you can't do science and humanities. You're a linguist, so you're going to do French, Italian and Latin. Um, and so uh, I said, OK, fine, if that's what you say. And afterwards, when I remembered that, it made me cross because I thought to myself, if they'd let me do biology, I'd be a neurosurgeon by now. <laughs> and and uh, probably having more fun. But, but there you go. So I, I just I just felt after working as a policy advisor for a number of years that I was too innocent about um, the what Joseph and I would call the hard power aspects of international relations. I didn't understand much about security and defense. I don't like it, but I had to understand it. And so I did this course and I felt more balanced afterwards. I felt that I, I, I could speak to uh, politicians, leaders of all sort, with a little more confidence that I understood the issues they were facing. Do you see something different because you have this uh, this um, the background, you know, do you discern things that you, probably a pure international relations expert or um, political science um, would not be able to see because you have also trained this sensibility, you know, this eye that is, you know, I mean, by, you know, social anthropology and literature can, you know, can, uh, give you a certain discipline that might maybe you know a, a, a international relation expert would not have do you think so do you think it no to be perfectly honest with you i think all i've really done is catch up um with with a with with a properly trained international mm -hmm. relations expert international relations really is an astonishing discipline um yeah. you need a you need a brain like a planet to to understand ir and i think that if you if you are um if you are a, a good and well-formed and attentive scholar of international relations, you know all of this stuff. So as I said, I was, I was catching up, but it is interesting that it was delivered to me from such very different perspectives. Um, the cultural and social, and if you like the more spiritual parts, through the medium of literature and linguistics, that's very different from the way that, for example, an international relations scholar would learn about the human factors. So I'm, I'm glad I did things the way I did. It was all an accident, it wasn't planned, um, but it does give me um, a choice of viewpoints. Uh, I think the, 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 the negative side of it is that it makes it even harder for me to have opinions about anything. I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I, I lost in admiration for people who have opinions. Everybody seems to have an opinion these days and society seems to require us to have very strong opinions about everything. The older I get, the harder I find it to have an opinion because every single topic is so complex. And the longer you live, the more you realize it. And you only have to spend five minutes looking at any particular subject, whether it's Israel, Palestine, or the pandemic, and you realize that there aren't two sides to the story. There are at least 11. And um, to have an opinion uh, is the very, very last place you ever get to. So as I get older, 
I feel certain of fewer and fewer things. Well, you are in a place where you must have a lot of opinions because we will ask you for a lot of opinions on uh, various topics, but we promise, you know, they will be related to your uh, work. Um, uh, in, in years, I mean, you've, you've been doing it for, for quite some time, you have, uh, you have um, come up with uh, f- uh, some seminal, I would say, seminal concept um, uh, nonetheless, uh, very um, uh, original, uh, but some of them have been uh, abandoned uh, along the way. I mean, you started. You are um, uh, you are credited uh, with uh, having coined the notion of uh, nation branding. You uh, you will um, explain it and elaborate on it uh, for. A, couple of years, of course, uh, advise governments, uh, PMs, uh, international organizations in this respect. Then you move to or uh, develop the notion into uh, the competitive identity concept, which is uh, a bit more elaborate, uh, elaborated, takes uh, into consideration uh, more aspects. Um, and then uh, you somehow uh, rejected all these notions, uh, uh, refused to talk about them and to be um, asked uh, uh, about them or to, um, to, uh, to give talks about them or also write about them. And you, um, uh, you built, you constructed this uh, notion of good country, which is also an index, it's a measurement tool, but it's also a way to describe um, uh, sort of country's generosity, what the country gives uh, to in terms of uh, international public goods uh, to the world. So is there a, a unifying thread in your thinking, starting from nation branding, starting from your past in international marketing, in advertisement, mm-hmm. Uh, through, uh, uh, through a competitive identity, which by the way, I believe is still a valid, powerful concept, but you know, I'm sure you will disagree, mm-hmm. and to the good country concept, which is what you do and uh, what you do today. Mm. Um, I th- I, it's always quite easy, perhaps um, too easy, to look back over your life and see a narrative that isn't really there. In reality, what I've done is I've just basically lurched from one obsession to another. Um, And they are linked insofar as they're things that I'm interested in. So they're linked by my interest in them. They are, I hope, developments of each other. So it's not as if I've completely changed subject. What, what's tended to happen? Because you see, I, I come at these things not as an academic. I'm really n- no kind of academic. I'm a practitioner. Um, and as a practitioner, it's inevitable that your thoughts and your theories and your accounts of how the world works are going to change if you're paying attention uh, to your work. And because my work as a policy advisor gives me the, the, the enormous privilege of being able to work with the people who run countries time after time after time. If I wasn't affected by what I learned by those conversations, then I, it would be unforgivable. And I'm so affected by them that they do shape my thinking. It's just inevitable. Um, academic, academics don't like this. And one of the reasons why my work is, is um, perhaps not cited um, in the academic texts as much as as, um, I would like it to be, um, is because I changed my mind about it. um, Academia doesn't like it if you change your mind. Um, You're supposed to have a um, a position and an area of expertise and you stick to it and you write about that because otherwise it makes it difficult for people to write about you because they don't, it depends which year they're describing. And so they don't like the fact that uh, I describe one thing in a certain way, and then two years later I change my mind. But there is um, there is definitely um, a what in Italian you would call a percorso. There's a there's a a route um, course, yeah. through 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 these subjects. I I at the beginning of my career, as you rightly say, I was I was in advertising. I was a copywriter. 
Now, that was mainly because I loved playing with words and the idea of being paid to play with words seemed like paradise and I enjoyed myself <laughs> thoroughly. But from writing uh, advertising copy to um, developing a passionate interest in the international side of the advertising field, to me, that was a revelation. The fact that the art, the skill, the craft of making advertisements also had to cross borders. And how do you do that? And so the cultural and linguistic and market differences, the anthropological differences indeed between one population and another, that was a truly fascinating uh, subject. So that pulled me away from the simple task of making advertisements. I became interested in the, uh, in the cross-border dimensions of promotion and marketing. And from that, I began to become quite interested in what marketing academics call country of origin effect. The idea that where your product comes from tells people something about what sort of product it is. And from that, it was natural that I should start becoming interested in countries and from there, it was natural that I would start wondering about the images of countries like the images of products. And that was why I made the, the, the fateful, fatal um, mistake of coining this term nation brand. <laughs> but Dorian, you, you know, because I've said this over and over again, the, the, the phrase I coined is not nation branding, it's nation brand. And those three letters do make a big difference because nation brand was simply an observation. All I said, and today it seems very banal indeed, it was a little more unusual back in 1998 when I first said it, but the point was simply that in this age of advanced globalization, where the people you know and work with and hire, the products you buy and use, the services you acquire and all the rest of it, they could come from almost literally anywhere. And we judge uh, these products um, and people and services very much based on our prejudices and assumptions um, about the countries that they come from. And truly in that sense, countries have brand images. If your country has a powerful and positive image, everything is easy and everything is cheap. If you're unlucky enough to have a weak or a negative reputation, that is a structural economic deficit. It basically means that everything you do as a country is more expensive and more difficult. And that's, I think, a powerful discovery. I, I, I didn't really realize the full implications of it until around about the time I wrote a book called Brand New Justice, which tried to marry economic development with nation brand theory, that I realized that actually the images of countries are one of the primary causes of global inequality because poor countries not only have to deal with the reality of weak in, in institutions and weak infrastructure and weak economies, they also have to do battle against this constant headwind of a negative reputation. So if you are um, a, a country in sub-Saharan Africa, even the good things you do are either ignored or uh, talked down or imputed to impure motivations or something of that sort. So this is a very, very significant effect in the modern world. And how can one not be interested in that? It's, it's one of the biggest things on the planet. But the, the word branding proved to be a bit toxic because it was too easy for lazy governments or impatient governments and greedy consultants uh, and advertising and PR agencies to turn it into a kind of promise. If you want a better image, we can give you a better image. We used to call that propaganda when we were young. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll talk we'll uh, we'll talk about this uh, this very important topic of uh, trying to change this uh, this negative ima uh, image. But before that, um, I, I would like to ask you. I mean, how how impactful was the fact that, or what you what did you learn from uh, looking at the Great Britain, your own country? in terms of the way you understand these dynamics of, uh, brand, of uh, nation brands, of uh, international reputation and so on? Or was you know, a country like uh, any other in terms of your, of your research and understanding of the field? I don't think there is any such thing as a country like any other. Um, all countries are very different and they all present their own peculiarities, of course. Um, I've never been particularly focused on my own country. In fact, it's very unusual for me to call the United Kingdom my own country. Um, I'm a poor, stateless cosmopolitan. I don't really think of myself as belonging to anywhere in particular. And it's just a, 
um, it's just a, a, a curiosity of my career that apart from one long-standing sort of unpaid honorary role in the in the Foreign Office, uh, I've done less work in the United Kingdom than almost anywhere on the planet. Um, Nemo in patria, they say, nobody is recognized uh, in his or her own homeland. Um, I have very little to do with the UK, even though I live there. Um, having said that, the UK is an interesting case, as is every other country. The UK, because um, it has one of the, uh, the most powerful, most positive, most evenly balanced uh, images. You use the, the lovely term national standing, which I think is a very good phrase for it. Um, the UK enjoys a remarkable international standing, which frankly, it doesn't do an awful lot to deserve anymore. And so I suppose that one of the things that, uh, if indeed it ever did, um, one of the things I began to learn in the case of the UK was how extraordinarily robust and resilient these national images are. They are vast cultural constructs. In the case of a famous country, a country like the UK, they're shared by most of humanity. And um, so there really is almost nothing you can do to improve them or even to damage them. Um, the, the UK, like most well-known countries, can get away with murder. I mean, we can leave the European Union and it doesn't have any impact on how much people admire us, which to me is extraordinary. Well, um, yeah, that was a huge historical um, development. Um, but, you know, of course, countries have a reputation and you have uh, already touched upon this, um, uh, this topic. Uh, but, you know, looking at the Good Country Index, the, um, uh, the Nation Brands Index, on other indexes, uh, on Soft Power Index or other indexes, we see somehow that we admire and emulate um, certain countries and uh, somehow uh, the same countries <laughs> Uh, uh, over and over, and uh, we ignore or even uh, dislike, uh, to a certain extent, other uh, countries, uh, and they are the same over and over again. How do you explain that? I don't think it's very difficult to explain at all. I, 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 you just have to ask yourself what sort of country would anybody most like to live in? And the majority of people would like to live in a country that's stable, prosperous, um, tolerant, where the, the, the rule of law is respected, where you can live a, a good standard of life, and even if it's expensive, you, it's possible to earn enough uh, to be able to pay for it. And this is why migrants the world over tend to head to the same countries, or at least aspire to end up in the same countries. And pretty much whatever you're measuring, you end up with the same countries, the usual suspects at the top. Um, I, I can't tell you how disappointed I was when, when I produced the first edition of the Good Country Index and the Nordic countries were at the top again. Well, not the very top. Actually, it was a delightful surprise that Ireland turned out to be the number one country in the first edition. Yeah. But, but after that, it's just the usual cluster of, of Nordic countries. And in the end, you know, we can joke about this, and of course I do, and, I, and, I, and I've, I've said that one of these days I'm going to invent a country ranking deliberately in order not to have the Nordic countries at the top of it. But I don't know what you'd have to measure to not have <laughs> Nordic countries at the top. An index of modesty, perhaps. But, uh, but the reality of the matter is that uh, some of those Nordic countries, and perhaps particularly Finland, are just by most standards, and yes, to some degree, this is a Western view, but it's a Western view that's shared by many people who don't come from the West. Um, these are the closest things that we have yet come as a species to a perfectly functioning society. They're very far from perfect, but they're an awful lot closer to perfect than the vast majority of countries. And that's the reason. Um, and I feel the same way about Europe. Um, I've, I've, uh, I've often been quoted as saying that the European Union uh, is the noblest experiment in the history of humanity. It's not surprising that European nations often end up at the top of my indexes and other people's indexes, because we're, I say we, even though the UK is no longer part of it, we in the European Union are the only countries really that have had the lived daily experience of collaboration and cooperation as a modus operandi. And we've seen and we've learned and we've understood the benefits of it. And so it's not surprising if we believe in it and it's not surprising if we behave rather well. 
which is not to say that the other countries that rank lower in the good country index are not beautiful, extraordinary places with their own story to tell. Of course, that goes without saying. But in terms of a well-functioning society where equality, justice, uh, peace, uh, and, and all the rest of it um, are in good standing, well, there aren't so many of those. In, uh, we, we have mentioned um, good country several times. Uh, maybe you know, for the, the viewers who are not very familiar with, with the way the index and the, the concept is aggregated, can you, uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about the concept, about the index, what are you measuring, what you understand from it, uh, and um, how it's to be interpreted? Of course. Well, the, the, um, the good country uh, index arose out of the concept of the good country and the good country concept arose out of the other index. So the other index is uh, the uh, Nation Brands Index, which I first launched in 2005. It's a simple opinion poll. It's a, it's a large one, but it's very simple. So it's now called the Anhold. Very large one. <laughs> yes, it's a large oh, very one. Um, so uh, so it, it's, it's now known as the Anhold Ipsos uh, Nation Brands Index because Ipsos are my research partners in it. And what we do every year, I've been doing it with different partners since 2005, uh, is we poll um, around about 20,000 people. Uh, it tends to be more and more as time goes on um, in 20 or so countries, sometimes more around the world. And we ask them, uh, we, we submit a very substantial questionnaire um, probing their perceptions of 50 uh, different countries. And that number is also uh, set to increase um, and so what this does is it gives us a real sense of how the world sees the world, how ordinary people, whatever an ordinary person is, I'm not sure, I don't think I've ever met one, but you know what I mean, just regular members of, of the civilian population around the world, how they perceive other countries in detail. So how they perceive uh, its, uh, its culture, its governance, its people, its products, uh, and its topography, and its, the opportunities it offers, the education, and so forth. Most of the time, these are perceptions that are not based on any real experience. We do also, of course, ask people if they've been to the country, if, they've, um, if they speak the language, if they know anything about it. The majority haven't because the majority of people on the planet don't travel and the majority of people have not visited the majority of other countries. So I sometimes jokingly call it the index of ignorance because what it's actually mapping is how little people know, but how much they believe about other countries. And these perceptions that people have about other countries are incredibly important because, as we said uh, a little while ago, they truly shape the way that the world treats other countries. If they like you, you do well. And um, so that's the, the Nation Brands Index. And I've been, I've been running that every year um, for a number of years. And I got to around about 2012. Um, and I realized that I actually hadn't asked this survey the most important question of all which is why do some countries actually have a better image than others? I'd already proved to my complete satisfaction that it was nothing to do with propaganda. In the, the years and years that I ran the nation, I still run the Nation Brands Index, there is absolutely zero correlation between the amount of money that countries spend on promoting themselves and their image. It just has no effect at all. And there are a lot of countries out there that spend sometimes- oh, my job. <laughs> You're doing, you're doing cultural relations. That's different. Yeah, yeah. You're, pro you're promoting a sector. Um, yeah. And I think, I think that promoting a sector, whether it's tourism or culture or investment opportunities or what have you, in those cases, communications is a meaningful exercise, A, because we know that it can work, uh, B, because your competitors are doing it, and if you don't do it, they'll steal a march on you, but C, because at heart, it's a very simple transaction. Uh, you're saying, here's a product, forgive me for calling culture a product, but you know what I mean. Um, I'm going to tell you about it, and if you like it, perhaps you'll engage in it. That's very simple and straightforward. But so much of this so-called nation branding is not really doing that. It's not looking at a particular sector. It's basically sending out propagandistic government messages saying to the world in general, you will admire my country. And that's what doesn't work. It just doesn't work. By the way, most cultural relations doesn't work either, but that's a different topic. If we had another couple of hours, we could go into it. <laughs> but, but I am a great, as you, as you well know, Dorian, I am a, I am, I'm a great believer in cultural relations as a means of introducing its true public diplomacy in the sense that it's the diplomacy that brings together publics with publics. 
And in that respect, over time, with patience and skill, it can actually uh, create good relations between countries. That's a very different thing from promoting the image of a country, um, partly because, as the British Council says, it's mutual. Uh, it's going in two directions. And that makes all the difference in the world. Um, but anyway, um, so the, the Nation Brands Index had been running uh, for, 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 for many years. And in 2012, I thought this would be a good moment to, to stop and to analyze this enormous database because it had reached a billion data points by this point. And I thought, I, I would like to know why, statistically speaking, people admire country A more than country B. Why does everybody in the world, well, the majority of people, admire um, the Czech Republic more than they admire Slovakia? I don't know. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to know. And so I spent uh, a year or so, um, because I'm a very bad statistician, uh, trying to dig out the drivers from, from, this, uh, from this subject, from, the, from this uh, the survey. And what I discovered was quite surprising. A number of reasons, a number of drivers of a good image are things that you would expect because people think it's beautiful, because they think it's powerful, because they think it's old, because they think it's, uh, but by far the most significant driver turns out to be because they think that it contributes something to the world in which they also live. In other words, the impact of countries outside their own borders is a more important determinant of their image than what they do inside their own borders. And that's quite interesting because 100% of all the nation branding attempts that you see talk about domestic facts. They say, look at us, we're wonderful. Look at our citizens, how beautiful they are. Look at our shops, how full they are of wonderful products that we make. Look at our landscapes, wouldn't you like to visit those? It's all 100% domestic and nobody's interested because everybody out there, they're not in the market for a new country. They don't want to buy a new country. They've got a perfectly good country of their own. What they're interested in is how does this country affect the world that I live in, okay? So I live in the United Kingdom. Um, I'm quite interested in Uruguay. In the end, I know that Uruguay is very far away from the UK. I know that it's not a significant geopolitical power. I therefore know that in the end, it's not really very relevant to my life. It's just a casual interest. So what do I want to know about Uruguay? That Uruguayan people live peaceful, tranquil lives? I'm happy for them, but that doesn't make a difference to me. What I want to know is that the government of Uruguay is doing something about climate change because that'll affect me. I want to know that it's doing something good in migration because that will affect me eventually. It's a global problem. I want to know that they're dealing with the pandemic, not domestically, but internationally in a positive way because that will affect me. So in the end, it turns out that if you're, as a country, you want a good image, you have to behave yourself. You have to be a principled player in international affairs. And that's what I call a good country. So to finish this very long answer to your very short question, that was why I thought I'd create the Good Country Index, because I actually don't know how good countries are, and neither does anybody else. It's a very, very difficult equation. I mean, you know, how good is China? Well, like any other country, it's good and it's bad. It does things that are pretty good news for all of us. It does some things which are pretty bad news for all of us. And would it be possible, I asked myself, to do a sort of a balance sheet and net it out and see, net net, does China do more good to the world, the rest of the world, the rest of humanity and the rest of the planet, or does it do more harm? Ignoring everything it does domestically, not because that's unimportant, but just because so many other people are measuring that. And I wanted to measure something that needed measuring. So what the Good Country Index has, has helped to do over the five or so issues that, uh, um, editions that have, have now come out is it, it doesn't give an answer to these questions because the questions are too difficult. But what it does do is it slightly changes the nature of the discussion from constantly asking how well is this country doing, GDP, productivity, profit, and all the rest of it, it now encourages people to ask a new question, which is how much is this country doing for all of us? And that to me is the most important question about a country in the 21st century. And that's the purpose of the index, to encourage people to ask that question. And uh, do you think that, uh, that there have been uh, a big variation in the way the, uh, the countries uh, scored in uh, in your index since you uh, started, or is as stable as the the brands, the nation brands index, or other indexes that tend to be very stable? Um, interesting point. It turns out um, that reality is much more volatile than perception. So uh, the perceptions which are measured in the nation brands index, as I said, it, the nation brands index is the most boring social survey ever conducted. 
because quite simply nobody ever changes their minds about other countries, or at least if they do over a very, very long period. And that's deliberate because we human beings, we don't want to be constantly worrying about other countries. There are too many of them. It's too confusing. It's too complicated. If, if, if you or I uh, started revising our opinions about countries every time they did something odd, we'd have no time left to eat or sleep. We'd yeah. spend our entire days revising our views about countries. So as the academics would say, country images are normative. We put them in the back of our mind in the freezer and we say France is chic and full of rich people wearing expensive clothes with lovely manners and great food that I don't want to eat because it'll make me fat. Uh, <laughs> these, these kinds of cliches, right? Uh, I won't tell you the Romanian cliche because you know it off by heart. Uh, and, and we put these cliches in the backs of our minds and we never, never, never modify them or revisit them if we can possibly help it because the world becomes too complicated. Reality, on the other hand, is reality and reality does change. So the good country index is somewhat more volatile. The overall clustering of countries doesn't change all that much because the countries that contribute most to the world outside their borders Generally speaking, the clusters of 20 or 30 countries are still those clusters, but the scores of individual countries can fluctuate, they can vacillate from year to year quite a lot, depending on what the country is doing. Let's talk about a little bit about this name, the good. Weren't you afraid that it would, um, uh, it would point out to a moral uh, conversation or to a, like making a moral point because of course, because of the, of the name. Uh, while you are describing a very objective process uh, by which you assess the contribution, a sort of ratio of contribution to a country to the, uh, the international public goods uh, mm. and not something, uh, you're not making a, a value judgment about uh, a certain place. Can you explain that? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the reason I'm afraid is, is, um, is not one I'm terribly proud of, but I know one thing about PR, and that is that if you haven't got a lot of money, you have to be annoying. Um, <laughs> and so the, the, using this phrase, good country, was deliberately provocative, uh, precisely because uh, good is such a familiar word even to non-English to, to, to non speakers around the world, everybody thinks they know what good means. And as you rightly say, it is associated with morality. So the risks are manifold. Um, the first and most obvious risk would be that people would assume that the opposite of a good country is a bad country. And who am I to say that countries are bad? Um, so I've been very careful to point out that the opposite of a good country in the way I mean it is not a bad country, it's a selfish country. So this is good the opposite of selfish, not good the opposite of bad. Now a lot of people have said to me, particularly academics, why on earth didn't you give this very serious ranking a serious name that would properly describe what it actually does? And so I would say to them, for example, and they would say <laughs> that contributions to the Commons Index and, uh, and I could only say to them, yes, you're absolutely right that that would be a more accurate description of what it is and what it does, but it would ensure that the index was completely ignored. And I don't want it to be ignored because I have no money, I can't promote it. I don't have any funding for these things. I pay for them out of my own pocket because nobody wants to fund me. Um, and also because I don't really want funders coming in and interfering with the way that the thing is done. I want to keep it as objective as I possibly to can. Become, uh, as to become gooder as you, uh, as yes. you find. <laughs> yeah, so good, so good, gooder, goodest, um, and ungood, ungooder, and ungoodest um, are the horrible neologi neologisms that I've coined uh, to, to, to fill the gap here. Because of course, better is also a value judgment. And, you know, I often say in the FAQs, I say I'm not making moral judgments about countries. Well, that's easy to say. And any philosopher would say you can claim that you're not making a moral judgment. But what else is this? Well, it's a measurement. It's not a judgment. The, the moral value that I ascribe to that measurement is indeed, in some senses, a moral value, even though I like to think that it's more utilitarian than subjective. What I'm trying to do is to say, objectively speaking, it is a good thing for all of humanity if a country emits less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, for example. Therefore, a country that emits less carbon dioxide or does its best to reduce its CO2 emissions is gooder because it is benefiting the rest of humanity uh, in a way that the rest of humanity can be glad of. 
So, of course, CO2 emissions is a very simple and very obvious case. As we go down the list of the 35 indicators, some of them are harder and harder and harder to justify philosophically, intellectually, psychologically, and, and so forth. But broadly speaking, um, it's not, first of all, it really isn't a judgment. I don't decide which country ranks where. It's just a simple, it's not, I won't even dignify it with the popular word algorithm. This isn't even an algorithm. It's just a very simple ranking. Um, and it, the Good Country Index is made up of 35 data sets that mostly come from the UN family. Um, and uh, so it's the best data that's available. It's not perfect, but really only the UN has the resources and the interest objectively to measure the way that countries behave around the world. And I've just taken the behaviors that appear to have more of an impact externally than internally, and I've put them together in a composite ranking. Let, let's uh, dwell a bit on uh, the relationship between um, uh, this goodness. Uh, goodity. Goodity uh, of, the, of the country and power, hard power. Mm. Um, there are uh, certain correlations uh, that we, we can, uh, observe at the, you know, when it comes to the, the brands, uh, the nation brands index. Uh, what about the correlation that um, have emerged from um, in the index, from how powerful, I mean, how powerful a country is in terms of hard power, military mm -hmm. power, economic power, mm -hmm. and this um, uh, generosity, I would say, this, uh, uh, this propensity to uh, contribute to the common international uh, good. Are there any correlations or, you know, is it a liability to be powerful and to be extraordinarily influential uh, from an economic standpoint? Yeah, How does it yeah. play? What, what a lot of interesting questions in, in that, Dorian. I'm, I hardly know where to start. <laughs> First of all, uh, correlations. So there is a, an astonishing correlation between the Nation Brands Index people's perceptions of countries and the good country index. More than 80%, according to my, my colleague, Robert Govers, who does a lot of the stats for me. Um, so what that implies is that, um, is that uh, world-friendly behavior, principled international behavior, is super strongly correlated with a positive image. So this is a very powerful and very important arguments when one is dealing with governments. What it basically means is that I can go to any government that I'm advising and say to them, you must do more on climate change, you must do more for the pandemic, you must do more for migration or human rights or conflict or whatever it is outside your own borders, not because it's a generous thing to do, not because it's morally correct, not because you'll go to heaven, but because it's in your interest. There's no point in talking to nation states as if they were moral entities because they're not moral entities. They're quite explicitly not moral entities. And even though the people who run them may well be moral entities, they don't exercise moral judgments when they're planning policy on the whole, because that's not what you do when you run a country, especially if you're a man. So um, I, um, uh, the, 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 the massive correlation between those two indicators is one of a number of signs that actually there are good, solid self-interest reasons for countries to tackle climate change and the other problems that we're facing today. That observation is the core of my book, The Good Country Equation. The equation basically says, if a country wants to do more trade, get more money, get more investment, get more talent, it needs a better image. If it wants a better image, it has to do more good. So let's all start doing more good, not because I say so, not because it's morally right, not because it's generous or altruistic. The idea of a nation state sacrificing itself for others is absurd. That's, it, it, I would say it's even morally wrong because your first duty of course is to your own people. I was never surprised or outraged in the least when uh, Donald Trump kept on saying America first. It's the most obvious thing for any national leader to say. Pretty much every American president has, uh, uh, there's ever been has said that in one form or another. And indeed the rulers of most countries say it. And it's a, as Homer Simpson would say, duh, if you've been elected to run your country, of course you put your people's interest first. But the, 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 where, I, where I would take issue with Donald Trump is the supposition that America coming first means everybody else has to come last. That's the bit that I challenge. And America of all countries has demonstrated perhaps better than many, the very sensible approach of trying to help other countries to aspire to come first as well, because that makes a better um, sand pit for you to play in as a country. 
So that's the that's the the the, the basic uh, principle, and that's what the correlation between the two indicator indicators um, tells us. So um, after answering that bit of your question, I've now forgotten what the other bit. Were. <laughs> well, well, the relationship with power, with how power. Uh, power, yes, of course. So, so um, obvious, you know, from the equation that you become more powerful, you know, by exercising uh, good on the international yeah. scale. That's yeah. the implication of this. Yes, and 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 I am the kind of power that we're talking about here is precisely what Joe Nye um, has in mind when he talks about soft power. Soft power, meaning in this in this context, uh, the the power to lead by example, the power to lead by attraction. The countries that people admire because they do good, because people are grateful to them, because people are glad that those countries exist. That is soft power in the purest sense. Having said that, I, I always have a bit of a problem with the phrase itself, soft power. Not, I think, the way that Joe and I intended it, but the way that it's often read, particularly in US government circles. Because the problem with the idea of soft power is that it's still power. It's still fundamentally about trying to achieve ascendancy over other nations. In the case of hard power, you do it by pointing a gun at them. In the case of soft power, you do it by throwing a symphony orchestra at them or, or by hitting them over the head with a pillow. Um, but it's still fundamentally a way of beating other countries. And that for me is the problem because the thing that's wrong with the world is that every single country is trying to beat every other country. And as long as that's our fixation, as long as that's the underpinning of all of our actions, the motivation behind all of our policymakers' choices, we will continue to go backwards and we will not go forwards for the simple reason um, that, uh, as I said in my, in my TED talk back in 2014, all of the challenges that humanity is facing are now far too big for any individual country to solve on its own. Therefore, we can only do, do this together. Therefore, we need a change in the culture of governance worldwide from fundamentally competitive to fundamentally collaborative. Now, having said that, I wouldn't want people to think that I've got a problem with competition. Competition is a wonderful thing. It's an instinct of human nature. We wouldn't have got as far as we've got without competition. It's only, as I always say, a problem when it becomes the only altar at which we worship. And I think that that's the wrong turning that we've taken. We worship exclusively in international relations, in diplomacy, in macroeconomics, in politics. We worship exclusively at the altar of competitiveness. And that has led us astray because wisdom for people, for organizations and for countries consists in being able to manage that delicate relationship between competition, cooperation and collaboration. Industry taught us how to do this back in the 1970s. You remember co-opetition. I think it was a, a notion introduced by Japanese auto manufacturers where uh, uh, auto makers compete with each other, but they also collaborate. You do that too much and it becomes an illegal cartel, but if you do it to the right level, it actually creates a, a rising tide that floats all ships. So I think the co coopetition is an experiment that's about 40 years overdue in the public sector. And how do you see the, um, uh, this idea of collaboration and you know, this urge to collaborate being affected by the pandemic? What are the lessons that you throw in terms of your plea? for education, for collaboration, for selfishness, in a sense, you know, or not selfishness, because this is not the right word. I mean, it's self-interest, but expressed through this uh, international generosity. How do you see, I mean, because the pandemic has uh, exposed a lot of things and, yeah. uh, and has illuminated a lot of corners of our uh, existence and indeed of ourselves. Yes. Uh, how do you see, you know, this, passionate plea for education and collaboration yep. in the light of this uh, most tragic uh, event. Um, I like that phrase, uh, shining a light in the, in the dark corners. I, that's, that, that's a really good way of putting it and that's how I see it. Um, if it doesn't sound too cynical, I think that the pandemic will prove to have been very useful to us despite the cost, despite the lives lost, despite the suffering, because in the end, this was a lesson we had to learn. Um, and it was a painful lesson. If it hadn't been painful, there would have been less chance that we would learn it. So what have we learned? First and most importantly, we've learned that the human race has no special dispensation to survive. Part of the reason I think why uh, humanity has responded so inadequately to the emergency of climate change 
is because in the end, we're like teenagers. We think we're immortal. And people tend to say, yeah, climate change, it's dangerous. And I've seen those films and I know about pollution and I'm still gonna carry on driving my gas guzzling car because somebody will find the solution. Humanity's not gonna die. We'll, we'll, we'll work this one out and the scientists will work it out for us like they always do. What the pandemic has showed us is that we are a vulnerable species and a tiny, 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 invisible microscopic, microscopic virus could genuinely wipe us out um, and may still do. And that has been such a salutary lesson for us to make us aware of our mortality and to give us a bit of humility because that's what teenagers need. And we are as a species teenagers. The other thing, perhaps a little bit um, more poetic is that um, it's brought us face to face with our interdependency. Um, because if you consume any form of news whatsoever, over the last two years, every time you look at your phone, every time you turn on the TV, you see the sight of other people, very different from yourself, wearing different clothes, worshiping different gods, living in different countries, eating different food, but suffering from the same pandemic and fearing the same fears and passing the same sleepless nights and losing relatives. And that has been so intensely powerful as a reminder that we are truly one species inhabiting one planet. And we needed that. We need that in order to understand and tackle climate change. We need it in order to understand and tackle migration and poverty and inequality and conflict and human rights abuses and modern day slavery and nuclear proliferation and small arms proliferation and gender abuse and abuse of children and all of the other challenges that we, we face today, which are all shared, all caused by people and all depend on us working together to solve them together. So the pandemic, if we survive it, I guess we will, um, is one of the most useful things that could ever have happened. One of the things I talk about in my book is the, um, the observation that I and many others have made that very often humanity only really um, stands up to defend itself when it's got a common enemy. And that's why the nation state has proved to be so powerful and people's att attach attachment to the nation state has been so powerful because you're surrounded by potential enemies. And if I'm in Romania, and I fear that the Bulgarians are coming or the Russians are coming or the French are coming or whatever it is, that's an enemy. And whichever leader I acquire who makes me anxious about that enemy is guaranteed to be able to stir me up into action and righteous fury and bloodthirsty violence. On the human level, we have no obvious enemy. The only time when people really, really previously had a sense of rooting for the human team was when they went to the cinema and watched a bad movie like Independence Day, when suddenly there is an enemy and it's the aliens. And for just a moment, when all of those people file out of the cinema, blinking their eyes in the afternoon sunshine, they're human beings and they're rooting for the humans, but it fades very, very quickly. Again, the pandemic, Donald Trump, who is no idiot, talked about it frequently as an enemy. I don't know if he went through quite the same thought process as I did, but nonetheless, uh, this virus has given us a sense of what an enemy might be, so small as to be invisible. Um, so why not also climate change? We've somehow failed to recognize climate change as our common enemy that we can fight together. Uh, these are not the solutions, but they are pointers towards perhaps the beginning of a solution. Uh, the trouble with climate change is that there is this lag of 10 or 20 years in atmospheric CO2, which means that if we pull off the normal human trick of pulling back from the brink at 11.59. Well, in this case, 11.59 is probably about 10 years too late, um, which, is, which is a worry, but still we've got to try. And still I find that I'm unfashionably optimistic. Um, I think that almost everything, almost everything is going in the right direction at the moment. I think this is a very exciting moment to be alive. And I see so many signs all the time that humanity is actually growing and developing quite quickly. Wow, that's, that's a powerful, uh, powerful statement. And I hope the lessons of the pandemic will be incorporated not only in our thinking, but also in our uh, action and in uh, more collaboration, more uh, uh, plural uh, action, more uh, um, multilateral um, cooperation. 
uh, I'm, I'm sure that our Romanian viewers are trepidating to learn um, what, uh, what is the score of uh, Romania in the Good Country Index. I won't reveal it and I won't invite you to reveal it because I want them to, um, to, um, uh, to get to the site, to the website and read the whole, uh, um, the whole study and, uh, and uh, get familiar with the, the thinking. It's very, very, uh, very interesting uh, research and very, very uh, useful. But I would like to ask you, you know, I uh, can't refrain in, <laughs> in doing that. Uh, what would you advise uh, Romania to do in order to get a bit higher on mm. this uh, good country level? Well, if you want to game the good country index, that's easy because it's very transparent. Um, there are uh, 35 indicators there. And if a government felt uh, that ranking higher in Simon Anholt's good country index was a worthwhile aspiration, then all they have to do is to pick the easiest one to improve on and improve on it. And if they manage to do four or five of them, it will make quite a difference to their score. Um, I think this would be a terrible mistake because even, even uh, if it were a much more celebrated index than the good country index, because indexes are just measurements of reality or, or sometimes measurements of perception, they're not really the point. I think that the, the question that I'm asked more often by friends in Romania, particularly uh, friends who, are, who work in government or who are connected to government, is actually about the other issues, about Romania's image. Because Romania, as you know, um, uh, with, with very good reason, is concerned about the way that it's regarded by the West, rest of the world and has been for a very, very long time. Um, the, um, the answer, uh, if, if it's true, and I think it is true, that Romania deserves a better image than it's got, then there's really only one thing that you do. And anybody can do this. You get a flip chart. And on the flip chart, you write a list of all of the things that keep everybody awake at night all over the world. So I would suggest pandemic number one, climate change number two, you get the idea. What are the things that everybody worries about wherever they are in the world? Take a step back and then say to yourself, which one of these could we in Romania actually do something about? If we really set our minds to it, given our genius, given our history, given the strength of certain sectors, given the abilities, the natural abilities of certain Romanians, given the kind of government we've got now and might expect to have in the future, which one or ones of those could we really make a difference? Very importantly, not alone, because the idea that Romania might fix climate change on its own or fix inequality on its own is preposterous. It would be just as preposterous if America thought it could fix any of these on their own. So one of the, I suppose the most important lessons for me working in this area over the years, public diplomacy or whatever you want to call it, is that it should be multilateral. It's not about one country trying to brag itself into a higher reputation than other countries. It's about how you work with other countries on commonly recognized problems and challenges and fears and risks in order to earn yourself the admiration of people around the world. If you want to be admired, you have to be admirable. So it's as simple as that. What can Romania do to become admirable? And that's not the same thing as what can we brag about? And sadly, every time I've been to Romania and have these conversations, it's always gone back to that bragging argument. And this is very, very common with countries that have still got a lot of progress to make, that are still in one sense or another of that horrible word, developing countries. They still feel that they have to measure up to the bigger, richer countries. But we don't live in that world anymore, where there are bigger, richer countries. We live in a world where every single one of 205 nations has an equal right and an equal responsibility and an equal duty to save humanity and save the planet. What Romania wants to do is by definition as good and as important and as valuable as what America or China or Russia or Germany want to do. Those ideas of uh, geostrategic power have gone out of the window. They don't matter anymore. What matters is what you're committed to and how much time and effort and imagination and courage you put into getting there. Any country can do this. And that's why this is an exciting age to be dealing with issues like this, because it's no longer a lottery. Just because you weren't, just because you didn't kill a lot of people and create an empire a hundred years ago, or just because you don't have a vast territory and hundreds of millions of people, it doesn't make any difference. 
What matters is how useful and relevant you are to people's lives. And any country can make the decision to do that. That's what Romania should do. It's very general, but I charge if you want specific information. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, we, we are already getting, uh, you know, much I will, um, I will pay it from my own pocket, you know, if uh, uh, the issue is, um, is raised. But, um, uh, you know, for, for people who are, of course, familiar, they know your, your argument, but I would like to remind that, uh, you know, when you say that there is a, a, a tons of money, you know, can, cannot fix an international image or international PR, no matter how uh, expensive and how sophisticated they can do that, but uh, with the exception of uh, al um, aligning uh, what the country really is and what it stands for with the international language, uh, with the international uh, image. So bringing the reality of the country to uh, the level of the international uh, international perception. And having said that, I, I wanted to uh, remind this argument because there are still things a country can and should do. Uh, you have mentioned um, a, um, a, a couple of themes of topics of extraordinary importance, but they are all political, uh, political topics. They are all themes, extraordinarily important, overwhelming, some of them but political, but related to, uh, to international affairs. Where is the culture, and this would be, you know, the end of our conversation, when do you, see, where do you see culture? I mean, you've touched upon this subject a bit, but maybe you can expand as a conclusion of our conversation. Where do you see culture? And I really don't want to lose my job and still, you know, want to prove that <laughs> I'm useful uh, here uh, abroad. Uh, when do you see, where do you see uh, culture in this uh, promotion uh, effort in telling the story of a country as it really is? Mm. Well, the challenge, as we all know, um, with, uh, with communicating and sharing your culture with people in other countries is making them want to do it. Uh, it's not doing it itself. Um, any fool can tell the story of uh, a country's culture. Um, you look it up in a book and you talk about the great sons and daughters of your fine nation and the wonderful things they've done in the past. The question is, as we say in English, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. And the fundamental issue is how do you make people sufficiently interested in your country that they will want to absorb that information when you offer it to them? It's remarkable how many countries still pursue a basically Soviet style propaganda approach to cultural relations and many other forms of sexual promotion. The idea that if people are ignorant about your country, that is due to an information gap, and therefore you must fill it with information. That really isn't the way things work today. It's not the way things ever worked. We live in an information age, we're overloaded with information. If people want to find out about Romanian culture, they don't need the Romanian Cultural Institute, they just need a thing called Wikipedia. The information is there if people want to access it. So the real challenge is how do you make people want to know? And in the same way, the, the issue is not do people like Romania or do they not like Romania? The issue is do they want to like Romania or do they not? And that's where the real challenge lies. And that's where I think culture comes into its own because culture underpins all of these things. A nation's culture is the tangible representation of the genius of its people. It's what makes Romania different from any other country. It's the thing that makes every country different from every other country. The most important thing of all is the thing that the British Council has reminded us of over and over and over again over the years, that it has to be mutual. You don't roll your culture up into a ball and project it at people and say, admire our glorious culture. Oh, sure, if you're China or Russia, you can probably get away with it because you've got so much and people want it anyway and they'll love it, whatever you do. But for most countries, it's not like that. It's about offering people shared cultural experiences, doing culture together. That's what makes it exciting. Um, the culture is a bit like jazz. It's much more fun to do it with other people than to listen to other people doing it. Um, and so, Thank uh, you for uh, not quoting the original, uh, <laughs> which was a different word, but... Uh, yeah. Yes, I know. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, um, the Nation Brands Index has showed over the years that it's through a nation's culture that people get to feel that they understand the three-dimensional reality of a country. Um, I've often talked about uh, th the idea of um, uh, people 
being metaphorically speaking psychopaths when it comes to other countries. The nature of the psychopath is that uh, he or she um, lacks the ability to see the three dimensional um, spiritual or social or uh, mental reality of other people. Other people to the psychopath look like cardboard cutouts. They look like two dimensional creatures without an inner life of their own. Culture is what stops people being psychopaths. It's what enables other people to see the three dimensional reality of your country and what it really stands for, instead of just looking at the surface. And that's why uh, the presentation and representation and mutual sharing of culture is such a vital, vital, vital instrument in international relations, because without it, nobody is going to like you or respect you or be interested in you. And I find myself with two big, big subjects constantly fighting this battle with governments to tell them this needs to be properly funded. One is culture and the other is education. And the trouble with both culture and, both edu and education is that they're both vocations. The people who work in the culture sector and the people who work in the educational sector are people who are there by vocation and they're going to do it anyway. The artists will still paint pictures, the poets will still write poems in the same way that the teachers will still teach kids, even if you don't pay them. And governments know that and they take advantage of it mercilessly, which is why culture and education are always, always, always underfunded by so many countries. And that's why, to come back to the supremacy of the Nordics again, Finland is so remarkable because it pays its teachers properly. It's as simple as that. And if you pay your teachers properly, then they start to enjoy a higher status in society. Education becomes more important. You get more educated children. If you get more educated children, you create a better human race uh, that won't find itself in as much trouble as we're in today. So um, the, the message to governments that I've given for the last 20 years and will continue to give is never, ever, ever underestimate the importance of properly supporting and properly funding culture and education because your nation's success depends on it. Well, um, thank you, uh, thank you, Simon, for ending on this uh, on this uh, note. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, all of your arguments are, um, um, you know, deserve, I should say, you know, three hours, four hours of uh, conversation. But unfortunately, time is limited. I would urge our viewers to um, pick up your books, you know, to buy them, you know, to take them out from um, from a library and and read them they are full of ideas full of uh, interesting arguments and full of this passionate plea but realistic and pragmatic for collaboration for education and uh, for culture always um, a i think a celebration of uh, thought and uh, and humor and um, and uh, goodwill a conversation with simon uh, simon Anholt. Uh, simon thank you very much for um, being uh, this um, new york afternoon uh, with uh, with us um, and good luck with the preparation of the next um, a good country uh, index and all the other um, indexes and research that you are uh, involved. Thank you, Dorian. Thank you very much indeed.